the record. Ah. Is it recording? I don't know. It, it said it said recording. It said recording. Yeah. Yes, but I, I was trying to record it locally as well. But um, I think that should be all right. Hello, um, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Great Balloon Debate, where we will be attempting nothing less than establishing which was the most significant crossing of all history. Was it Caesar crossing the Rubicon? a crossing so significant that it has entered our vocabulary? Or was it Anne Boleyn crossing her legs and not giving out to Henry until she had secured a marriage and therefore creating the rift with Rome and turning this country and all its uh, successor states Protestant? Um, each of our panelists will be giving a short three minute presentation arguing for our chosen crossing and then you, the audience, will have an opportunity to vote. The conceit of a balloon debate, which uh, Rick is living to the full, is that we are all on a balloon that has sprung a leak and we are hurtling towards Earth. And you have to decide, you the audience, have to decide which of us survives. Uh, to make things a tad less morbid, um, we, have, we can have two survivors. If I have set up the poll correctly, and you should be able to click on a poll, um, you should be able to vote on the most significant crossing as well as the most convincing argument. It will not be the same thing. And you should also be able to suggest a crossing of your own and why you think it to be so significant. And so, as Caesar himself put it, alea yacta est, the die is cast. Sarah, take it away. Well, clearly the 1607, uh, the 1607 crossing of the Susan Constant Godspeed and Discovery, which brought the Jamestown colonists to America was the most significant in all of history. And that's not just because it was the beginning of the future USA, though that doesn't hurt. And it's also not just because it was the beginning of the British Empire, though that also doesn't hurt. Yes, everything British Empire and everything USA started with these three ships. And that should be enough to handily win this debate, but there's more. The crossing at Jamestown was the first to successfully challenge Spanish dominance of the new world. And that paved the way for, for French colonization, Dutch trade and their golden age. And beyond even that, it led to the conflicts which made modern style political, democratic and religious ideas mainstream. The English Civil War, or as it might more accurately be called, the English Revolution, would have looked dramatically different without the American colonies' radicalizing influence and contribution of soldiers. And it might not have happened at all. This led to constitutional monarchy, the explosion of democratic ideas, the first ever king to be executed by his own people, and it would also pave the way for the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and arguably every revolution that followed. So that means no Cromwell, no Napoleon, and who knows what else. The modern world would be unimaginably different without this having happened. And it happened against all odds, regardless of Columbus's voyage. It changed the world. And if that weren't enough, it also taught us that raccoons exist. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now let's pass on to Roberto. All righty. From 1697 to 1698, I, Peter the Great of Russia, the then Tsar of Russia, traveled across the great European continent with my Grand Embassy to strengthen and broaden the Holy League against the Ottoman Empire, and of course, to hire foreign specialists to improve my military weaponry. I went in disguise, dressed as carpenter, under the name Pyotr Mikhailov. Of course, the people saw through my clever disguise as I am man at six foot eight inches with, with tiny head. Um, however, I stopped in the Netherlands and worked as shipbuilder where I owned the skills of my favorite hobby, shipbuilding. I, of course, have been building ships since I was young lad and learning from the Dutch only ensured I was best in Russia. I then crossed channel and arrived to England. While there, I became fast friends with the Marquess of Carmarthen, Peregrine Osborne. I found one good thing about Osborne. 
he could drink as much as I could. We went to pub so much that pub changed name to Tsar of Muscovy. The English were very much fun, and we then went to Sayas Court. Of course, we partied harder while there and left the house in ruin from all the crazy things we did. I did not just drink while in England. I studied English techniques of city building that I used to build up St. Petersburg. I learned skills in dockyard to raise my Russian fleet. I fast learned art and science of British shipbuilding practices. I learned much while abroad and used all information from England to modernize Russian military and navy. You could say I was a Russian spy. However, my grand embassy failed thanks to my rebellious strategy in Moscow and my hasty return there. Positively, it let me implement what I learned abroad to make alliance with Augustus II of Poland Lithuania and start preparation and start preparations against the Swedes in Great Northern War. I then became emperor. So that is why the Grand Embassy is best crossing of Europe. Okie dokie. <laughs> Go for it, Greta. So as far as crossings, I have one word, potatoes. And specifically the voyages that sent the white flesh potatoes out to the rest of the world eastward. So not, not, the, not the orange sweet potatoes. Okay, so they were responsible, not just for memorable meals, but for enjoyably iconic fashions and a good bit of humor as well. So they are uh, responsible for literary and visual moments as well. So <clears throat> to begin, <laughs> The first potatoes were recognized as poison, which they had been. But because of the fantabulous botany skills of those South Americans, they were made into edible tubers. However, the English did not understand this, nor did the Spanish or the Portuguese. So initially, they tried to smoke them and use them as building materials. But they did notice the starch, which is why everybody in 15th, 16th century England and Holland have those red ridiculous collars. Um, now, Elizabeth first, she did love herself a potato pie, but she was eating the fancy Spanish sweet potatoes. So leave that behind. But they were spread to the Dutch, the English, the Irish, the Swiss, the Germans, Prussians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Russians, Poland's, Indians, and even the Chinese. And they all absorbed the potato into their cuisines. So we got bitterball and fish and chips, kolkan and roshki, pickled potatoes, and so many other potato things in Central Europe potato vodka, take that Peter the Great, and potato curries, mainly samosas though. And of course the vinegared fried Szechuan potato shreds that are like nothing else I've ever had on this earth. But beyond Sam Wise's soliloquy on potatoes that I still hold as the inspiration for the Bubba in Forrest Gump soliloquy on shrimp, there are acres of Irish potato jokes, but those are really old. What we need now and what exists are the black humor of the Latvian potato meme. And in these dark times, the Latvian potato meme, and can I share my screen for a second? Okay, boop, 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 boop. Let's see, let's see, um, let's see, can you see that? No. Um. Okay. So anyway, so you need to look up the the Latvian potato meme. Oh, here we go. Share screen. Uh, and boop. there we go. Boop. Come on. Got it. Up. Oh, no. Anyway, so the joke is. What did one potato say to the other potato? And one Latvian man says to the other man, joke is not possible. Who has two potatoes? And there are many, many more. So while the jokes are good, the food is even better. There are many comfort foods that are inaccessible to any number of people due to food allergies or their food choices or the fact that things like ice cream just melt. So, 
we have poutine, the ultimate comfort food that can be made to any of your tastes. Potatoes are gentle on the stomach. They're incredibly nutritious. They are very shelf stable and you can make any poutine that you want. So after millennia, potatoes are here for us. They make us laugh and they feed us and they offer so many things for everyone to partake, including that social lubrication and escape and relaxation we need from stress. So it is potatoes that will get us through Viva Bolivia. All right, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and who have we got next? I think it's Ben. All right. We will hear about and have heard about many great crosses today, crossing the Atlantic, crossing the Rubicon. But I'm here to tell you about what is clearly the most important cross of all, crisscross. Now, the fame of this act is such that they require no introduction from me, but in the name of filling three minutes, please condescend to allow me to remind you of their fame. Criss Cross is the name of a hip hop duo plus producer from Atlanta, Georgia, most famous for the song Jump, which sat at number one on the Hot 100 for eight weeks straight in 1991. Along with their producer and writing partner, Jermaine Dupree, these two towering talents gave the world two platinum albums and one gold certified album before gracefully ending their career. This was all the more remarkable because at the time of Jump's release in 1991, Christopher Kelly and Christopher Smith were aged 13 and 12 respectively, and remain the youngest rappers to achieve a number one hit to this day. Chris Kelly and Chris Smith were Atlanta natives and met in first grade. After several years of hanging out and honing their skills and fashion sense, they happened to be at the Greenbrier Mall one fine day when their fashion sense was noticed by Jermaine Dupri, an up and coming producer who was 19 at the time. Deciding to work together, the three wrote the song Jump, which was already a major hit by the time the album, totally crossed out, uh, became a mainstay on uh, MTV. Uh, sorry hit the shelves of record stores across Atlanta, the country, and the world. The video of Jump became a mainstay on MTV, and they soon found themselves touring with Michael Jackson. The two also starred in a Sega CD video game in which the user could remix elements of their song using provided samples. While a total critical and commercial flop produced on a platform, which is itself a long-running joke at this point, uh, it was not a forgettable generic platformer and represented an interesting early experiment in electronic musical production for the average consumer. When asked about their legacy in later years, Chris Kelly would talk about how the duo allowed hip hop to start talking to younger rappers, sorry, start taking uh, younger rappers seriously. This certainly was a genre defining trend. As the last two decades will show, it has been younger and younger members of the hip hop community who have been achieving chart success, albeit none have achieved success as young as Criss Cross. Hip hop has become a mainstream genre, subject to the same market forces that drive all pop music to capitalize on the purchasing power of young people nagging their parents. In allowing young people to see themselves in the style and persona of these two young men, Criss Cross allowed hip hop to cement its place as a genre with crossover potential. And so I submit to you all, Criss Cross. Fantastic, thank you very much. That was uh, in, yeah, niche. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me hand over to uh, Trevor in a burning building. Good luck. This presentation will go better if you can hear me. Now, the only person or people to win the greatest crossing should be named the great. And while building boats is nice, I have donned the diadem here to explain how Alexander crossing Asia is the greatest crossing of all time. Alexander was a flame that burned short and bright. His death had immediate consequences for the region, most of which involved people getting skewered on the ends of spears. But beyond his lifetime, 
Alexander's legacy is incalculable. Without Alexander, you don't get something as simple as the modern Greek language. By bringing together all of the disparate peoples of Greece into one unified goal of crossing, conquering, and burning down the Persian Empire, you don't get the Koine Greek language, which is the ancestor of the modern Greek language. Instead, you'd end up with a bunch of little regional things all bickering and eventually turning into separate languages altogether. At the eastern extreme of Alexander's empire, the Greeks influenced India, especially in the realm of statuary. And in the most eastern extreme of all, the Greek influence on Buddhist statuary became the defining Buddhist art style for all time with Greek style statues of the Buddha stretching from Japan to North America in the modern day. On the Western extreme, Alexander borrowed and adopted the Persian concept of governors over centrally appointed provinces which was picked up by essentially every subsequent Western empire, most notably the Romans. So if you have, say, provinces or states or whatever it is the British or countries these days in your home nation, that is a legacy of Alexander. And most importantly, Alexander laid the groundwork for basically every romantic, young, heroic figure you can close your eyes and picture today. The long flowing hair, the pretty young face, the narrow features, that's not Prince Charming, that is Alexander the Great. So every bit of media with that figure in it goes back to Alexander. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and so I think we're handing over to Jen and Jenny. Jenny, you're on mute. Okay, hi. <laughs> Everyone thinks that Julius Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon marked the end of the Roman Republic, but actually his big moment was just an echo of previous events. About 28 years before Caesar, a populist general crossed the Rubicon with an army and marched them down toward Rome. Uh, that general was defeated. Crossing the Rubicon with an army was not original. It was just a page from the Roman dictator's playbook. To understand the real end of the Republic, you have to understand a woman named Fulvia. Fulvia was the wife of Mark Antony, but before she married him, she was married to Clodius. Clodius was a populist statesman and leader of the street gangs. He used gang violence to affect political outcomes, and Fulvia was right there with him, winning the gang's loyalty. When Clodius was assassinated, Fulvia ran the gangs on her own. She stage managed an epic funeral for Clodius that led to intense riots. When Julius Caesar went to war with Pompey for control of the Roman Republic, he left Mark Antony in charge of Rome. Mark Antony and Fulvia married, and she crossed boundaries again, returning to political power via her husband. And after Julius Caesar was assassinated, Fulvia was the reason that Rome turned into an empire. The, the initial narrative around Caesar's assassination, the one pushed by the assassins, was that this was a justified political murder. Initially, the public agreed. They remembered how bad it had been under kings and dictators. Caesar's death should have strengthened Rome's commitment to democracy, a corrupt democracy that left a lot of people out, but you know, we digress. Enter Fulvia. She stage managed Caesar's funeral. She had Caesar's body raised up before the crowd so that everybody could see the stab wounds to Caesar who just wanted to expand the rights of the common man. And she used her street gangs to rile up the crowds. So Fulvia crossed boundaries yet again, going against the traditional narrative to paint Caesar's assassination as the killing of a populist, as even an anti-democratic event. And she gave the crowd an avenue to express their feelings, the only way that the elites would listen, through mob violence. And it worked. Caesar's assassins were driven out of Rome. The second triumvirate was created and Fulvia was the unofficial fourth member. She helped lead bloody prescriptions that would see the hands of Cicero nailed to the Senate platform. She pierced his tongue with a golden hairpin because she was a badass. Fulvia crossed gender boundaries in pursuit of power. She fought for Mark Antony's interests, even as he did her dirty by cheating on her with Cleopatra. 
And eventually she led an army herself going to war against her fellow triumvir, Octavian. She lost and died soon after. Fulvia's death marked the end of anyone being able to cross the Rubicon. After her death, Mark Antony married Octavian's sister and the Julio-Claudian dynasty was founded. Rome became an empire and democracy was dead. Everything that happened next, the foundations of Western history itself, never would have happened without Fulvia crossing gender boundaries and the dominant narrative. So the next time someone tries to tell you that the crossing of the Rubicon or the Battle of Actium marked the end of the Roman Republic, please correct them. Tell them the story of Fulvia. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and well, Rick, I think uh, in your balloon, uh, tell us all about it. Good luck. Yeah, hello. Thank you. I've been keeping us in the air whilst everybody else has been chatting. Okay. So <laughs> ah, the greatest crossing in human history. Hello, Anton. Hello. The greatest crossing in human history. That's a very big question that needs an equally big answer. An answer so big that no human can actually go on it. It is one that spans the solar system and beyond, and it is the Voyager spacecraft. Over 20 billion kilometres, or 12.5 billion miles, um, from Earth, that's 150 times further from the sun than we are. And after you precisely slingshot from planet to planet using their gravity, and it takes hours for signals to travel from Earth to the Voyager that's still out there today. And to command it, to send those signals, again, would take hours and have to be very precise, accurate movements. Now, Voyager is the first ever man-made object to leave the solar system nearly 10 years ago. It is an interstellar, interstellar space. We, thanks to it, are an interstellar species. But it's not just amazing science. Each of the Voyager spacecraft has got a gold record on it, which has been designed to last for billions of years. And these discs contain music from around the world and also greetings and messages from 55 languages. I mean, that's spanning so many cultures all encapsulated on these discs. There was a message from Jimmy Carter, then US president, and he said, this is a present from a small distant world, a token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so we may live into yours. I mean, it doesn't give you goosebumps, don't know what will. In five billion years, when the sun expands and erases all evidence of mankind, all our achievements, all the other crossings that are gonna be mentioned here today, Voyager will still remain. And if it's discovered by aliens, well, on the Voyager, there's a map of where Earth sits in the Milky Way, marked by pulsars. And also there are etched figures of a man and a woman, and also a diagram of hydrogen atoms, some universal language to try and communicate. Imagine if an alien artifact crashed to Earth, how would we understand it? Well, these records are our attempt to cross the ultimate barrier. We need more projects like Voyager, ones that cross not just boundaries of science and space, but also of art and culture, of humanity. Something we can all get excited about. Something that will help us find our place in the universe. Voyager has become more than science. This is our attempt to say why we are here. To quote Carl Sagan, when he's talking about the iconic pale, pale blue dot, which I hope you all know this photo, it's a tiny, tiny little picture of Earth taken as the Voyager had passed all the other planets, the first time we'd ever seen them up place. And he said, look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On, every, uh, on it is everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, our delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this pale light. And that's why I think that's the greatest crossing. Well, wow, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was great. Um, I like your co-pilot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, I'm afraid that Jack um, hasn't been able to make it. And so that leaves just me. So just by saying the year, 1492, all of you will know exactly what crossing I am speaking about, because my proposition to you today is that Christopher Columbus's Atlantic crossing was the most significant crossing of all history. In the short time available, I will barely be able to cover anything. So let's see how I get on. I've got props. 
I say tomato. You say, I say potato. No, I don't actually say potato. Um, and I've got chilies. I've got popcorn. Um, I've got nicotine gum. Well, I've got nicotine gum. It's not nicotine. I've given up the fags. Um, but imagine a world without tomatoes. No pizza, no ketchup, no fancy tomato and mozzarella salad, or a world without potatoes. No chips of either sort. Even as a negative, the absence of potatoes from Ireland would have meant that there, there wouldn't have been the blight that sent so many Irish people across the Atlantic to seek a better life. No popcorn? Well, you might as well not even bother having movies. And while tobacco is undoubtedly a bad thing, it has had a massive impact on the world. Equally, we could have an inventory of foodstuffs that have gone the other way and are a key part of the American diet. Imagine no bacon, no bread even. Okay, so hands up, anyone who is joining us from the Americas, but isn't of Native American heritage. So if it wasn't for my crossing, literally none of us, none of you would be here today. And as we mentioned, the Native American inhabitants, we can obviously not ignore the negative significance of the crossing of 1492. This was a Holocaust. And while where entire populations were completely eradicated from the Caribbean islands and with unfathomable numbers dying across North and South America, for example, an estimated 25 million people lived in central Mexico and they were reduced to less than 2 million 100, 100 years on from 1492, dying from a combination of war and disease. But let's consider religion. To a certain extent, the Americas can be seen as the great saviors of Christianity, if that's your thing. And um, while we are becoming increasingly atheistic over here in the old world, Christianity flourishes in both North and South America. The impact of 1492 has been called the Columbian Exchange to describe this massive interchange of people, animals, plants, and diseases between Eastern and Western hemispheres. My esteemed colleagues here, all far more learned than me, have sold you more niche crossings, which will undoubtedly pique your interest. But when you are alone in the ballot box, casting your crucial vote, can you really say that any of their crossings was more significant than that most famous one that literally brought us all here today together? Thank you. And looks like Jack has made a last minute appearance. Jack, are you with us? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Luke, I don't think I could top that. But please give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's likely somebody already said mine. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the most important crossings in history, the most important is humans crossing our atmosphere from our planet to outer space. And I think this because um, even it's a relatively new thing that we've been able to do as a species. But I think long term, within the next century or, or two, assuming we don't kill ourselves before then, we're going to see a lot of um, expansion in outer space in terms of just pure exploration but also for our commercial or economic purposes. And I think that kind of exploration is going to make us, may at least make the people that are going out into space feel a little, uh, feel more of a sense of camaraderie than um, people of different nations feel, at least on the planet. And it certainly will, spark a lot of technological innovation that is something that not only we could use in outer space, but 
here on earth in terms of what kind of energies that we, we will need to cross such vast distances. And if we can do it efficiently, then perhaps power grids can be transferred over to some technology that is similar to that. That's all I got. Luke, you're muted. Such a professional. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and many things, uh, here, but not professional. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we don't like professionalism. Um, cool. So, yes, sorry, just to recap on what everybody covered, uh, we had Sarah presenting 1607. We had Roberto inhabiting uh, Peter the Great. Um, we had Greta presenting potatoes. Trevor living Alexander the Great. Lots of greats. Um, Jenny and Jen gave us Fulvia. Uh, Rick and Anton presented the Voyager. I did uh, Luke uh, in 1492. Um, and then Jack gave us space travel. So now is the time to vote. Can, that, can everyone access the, the poll? That's P-O-L-L -L rather than somebody from Eastern Europe. Um, Cool, it's all happening, it's all happening. Um, if you can't, you can just raise your hands. It's all neck and neck. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, we are all used to being paused. Sorry, this is like Eurovision, but, but better. <laughs> the nul point. Um, uh, has anyone got any questions to, to ask the panelists? Well, while, while the voting goes on, I don't want to. I don't want to call an end to it. I'm um, saying I can sing if you want to. Speak, like your vision. You could sing, yeah. If you got any Georgian <laughs> traditional Georgian music? You could you could serenade us with. Oh, uh, I could I, I could do. Russian traditional music and Spanish traditional music, and you know, oh, D. God. Martin. <laughs> really, really? Cool. Oh, share results. Can everyone see that? I can't see the answer for the long question. Very annoying. People have. Why is that not working? I probably need to stop the poll. So we'll give it a couple more minutes. Everyone seems to like ham. Yeah, I just couldn't. No love for Chris Cross. <laughs> Chris, Chris Cross, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, for <laughs> either, you know, who doesn't like drunken parties? Oh, uh, Rowena asked in the poll in the Q and A, um, how did you get the poll back? Because she clicked it and it disappeared. Ah. I clicked it. Oh God! Um, can't see. No. Um, oh, they found it. Yeah, so just scroll to like where the bottom bar is, where you would find like the chat and all that. And you should say polls on the bottom, just for anyone who is struggling there. Right. Like where it says like chat, you know, mute, stop video, you know, normal Zoom stuff. <laughs> um, I like, Robert Ross has has come up with an alternative. Oh, good, Romina, cool. Um, that mine is Cortez, not Columbus. And Columbus was a sideshow in 1490 Spain. True. He was the guy who got there. Huh? Cortez led the pro led to profitable exploitation of the Americans, America's subjugation, genocide of Indians, slave trade from Africa, and global trade. I realized the Portuguese kind of started this. Good points, good points. But he didn't have to go very far, though. You know, Hispaniola to Mexico is only just a short hop. It's hardly a crossing. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop sharing the poll because I think this might activate it. 
So we, if if anyone, if you just want to raise hand, well, I don't know how we're going to do that. Right, I'm going to stop sharing it and then share results. How's that going to work? I can't see. Uh, that makes sense. Oh, too much going on. Can't my vote here. My vote was for Luke. Thanks, Rowena. It's the Buckinghamshire Buckinghamshire massive here. Um, great. So the results we have. Um, so which was the most significant crossing in history? Sarah, Trevor, Jenny, and Jen are all tied. Um, there you go. There's there's only three people who were able to participate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's okay. Let's do this. Okay. If anyone didn't vote on the poll thing please raise your hand to vote for sarah i'm going to add this to your your one no um please raise your hand to vote for roberta oh roberta is getting a lot of love um cool or was that for sarah who knows um it's almost like this is not significant <laughs> oh, this is not <laughs> important. Um, and I shouldn't be running a democracy. Um, okay, so very quickly, raise your hands if you're voting for Greta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very democratic. For Ben. But is that your own hand, Ben? It's my own hand, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. For Trevor. Yeah. It's fun though. Thank you, Diogenes. Thank you, Diogenes. <laughs> Sorry, I just said that as if it was normal to have Diogenes in the in the audience. Um, and so where were we? We were with Je Trevor, Jenny, and Jen. Any more hands for Jenny and Jen? Okay, Grit is going. Uh, Rick and Anton. I think we're going to have to call this a tie, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. I think we are going to call this a, what is it, 10 way tie <laughs> in the interests of love and harmony, um, because that's the kind of people uh, we I'm, are. It's a nine I was way tie. Say, I provided all the vodka. Along with Greta. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Wait for the after party for the vodka. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I hope the uh, Anton won't be jo joining us with, uh, for the vodka drinking. No, I'll have his bit. Don't worry. I'm just going to get a bit more uh, air. <laughs> yes. Yes. We need more air. We need Very to go. Up. We need to go. Up. We need to carry us all <laughs> into, into the stratosphere. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your gumbo talk. And uh, we'll see you in wherever we're going next. I'm talking. Bye, all. Thanks. Time to see things blow up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>